Before all else, I'd like to express my delight and appreciation that all of you have come here to this place in this way, namely in order to find understanding of Dhamma so that you can use it to live your lives more peacefully, more successfully. This word Dhamma has many meanings, many levels and layers of meaning. However, here we'll stay with one simple, direct meaning, which we can express by saying that if a person lacks Dhamma in their everyday life, then their life will bite its owner. They will have to live with an endless stream of pain, suffering, and misery. We will study and explore Dhamma as the law or truth of nature. We do not intend here to study it as a religion, but simply as natural truth or natural law. Or we can explore it as a science, as a particular branch of science, but not materialistic or physical science, rather a mental science or spiritual science. If we wish, we can approach Dhamma in this way also. Or another way we can look at it is as art, as the supreme art, which enables us to live life above all problems, so that we can live with minds that are untroubled by any of the situations and problems in the world. In this way, we can speak of Dhamma as the highest or the supreme art. Many foreigners come to Thailand in order to purchase Buddhist art. They want to take some Buddhist art home with them. But what is kind of funny is all they take away are material objects, which is not actually Buddhist art. It's just the products and artifacts of craftsmanship. <coughs> these Buddha images and paintings and carvings are not real Buddhist art. True Buddhist art is not some material thing, but is the, the ability to live life so that there are no problems, to live life above all problems. This is a spiritual art. And this is by far the most beautiful art form, the spiritual kind. Now we'd like to say a few things about the time. This time of day is usually a time for sleeping. At this time, most people are looking for some happiness and pleasure from sleeping. However, we use it in order to study. There are certain reasons why this is an excellent time for investigating profound matters, such as the Dhamma. Generally, this is a time of blossoming, of opening up. Around this time, most flowers are beginning to blossom. Soon the sun will rise. This is a time of blossoming. In fact, the Buddha awakened around this time. 
So this is a good time for our minds to open up to to truth. Another way of looking at it is it's another world or another corner of the world which is for blossoming. Most people don't look at it this way. They they consider this to be a time for sleeping. But please don't begrudge us your sleep or any difficulties in coming here. But instead, because if we're asleep, we were unable to see this as any kind of world. When we're asleep, there's no chance of learning anything. And so we suggest you look at this as a time of blossoming in order that you can benefit and open up to something. And something else very important is that you must walk from the meditation center to here. This is quite important. We would like you to use this morning walk as an opportunity to practice the highest Dhamma. That is to walk without there being a walker. That there is just walking and no no walker. This is the highest Dhamma in Buddhism where everything can be done without there needing to be some I, some me to do it. So we we hope that you can use this opportunity to walk here with the highest Dhamma. You should take it to be a a lesson or as being in a kind of school. Walking here ought to be a kind of study. If you practice this, then you will be able to learn to do everything without a doer so that any movement, any activity is done by the body and the mind without requiring some me, some ego. But just through the nervous system, the mind with the mind controls the body and our activity needs to be done. So we cannot learn to apply this to eating. So there is simply the activity of eating without the eater, the me or the ego who eats. So we eat or do whatever simply with mindfulness and a ready active wisdom knowing what's taking place and responding properly. This can be done without requiring any me, any I. Learning to, we can learn to do all things in this way. Basically, there are six activities. There's seeing. When seeing some visual form with the eyes, there's no need to be the, for the eye, the ego that sees. In hearing sounds by the ear, it isn't necessary that there's a me who hears or some hearer. In smelling odors through the nose, there's no need for an I, an ego, to smell. In tasting flavors through the tongue, there isn't a need for some I, some me, that tastes or knows those flavors. When 
feeling touches and physical sensations through the skin and body sense. There isn't any need for a me, for an ego. Even thinking, when the mind knows thoughts within the mind, there isn't a need for a thinker, for some person or ego who thinks in all these basic activities and functions of life. It isn't necessary that there is some I, some me, to do them. All of this is a way of expressing the Buddhist teaching of anatta, anatta, which means not self, not self, that all things are not self that one cannot find anything anywhere which can be taken to be self, to be me, to be I. This is the heart of Buddhism. All of Buddhism is found or comes to this, this one simple teaching of anatta, everything is not self. You will find a real self anywhere. Because of this teaching or principle of not-self, Buddhism is unlike any other religion. But some people will say that this is crazy or even that this is absolutely stupid, this business of not-self because there are many people who insist on having self, of being self. Many people just have to have a self. They want to have a better self, or a special self, or a higher self, or something like this. And so they, they can't make any sense out of, they can't accept the Buddhist teaching of not self. But this whole thing about self is the central issue in life. Because as soon as we've got a self, then life fights its owner. But when we realize that there is life already and can continue to be life without any self, then life no longer bites its owner. So this, this thing about self is not any craziness or insanity. It's a very important secret of life. Nonetheless, many people just cannot accept it because they want to have a good self, a better self, a higher self. The condition of dukkha or the experience which is like tormenting, the condition of torment in life is, is like carrying a heavy weight, like carrying a burden. And this burden is nothing other than self, than atta. For example, the hand, when the hand has nothing to carry, it's free, and it has no difficulties, no strain. In the same way, when the mind has no burden, then it's, it's free. But as soon as the mind grasps at something as being self, whenever there is the concept, me, I, then this becomes a burden for the mind. And this is the burden which torments, which makes the mind suffer. This, this heavy weight of self, of I, of Atta. Now this attachment to self has both positive and negative forms. Don't go thinking that 
there is only attachment to negative things, that attaching to positive things is no problem. You ought to observe that attaching to the positive is just as heavy and painful as attaching to the negative. The condition of dukkha, of torment, is there as much in clinging to the positive. In fact, the positive can trick us into attaching to it much more than the negative. And so sometimes the, the pain and misery due to the positive is even greater than the negative. We can attach in a negative way, we can attach in a positive way. Either way, it bites its owner. And so we need to, to learn to live without clinging to either the positive or the negative. But we value positive things so much that we're unwilling to do this. We get tricked into this. So whenever we fall in love with something positive, then the inevitable result is a heaviness, having to carry the weight of, of ego, of self. There's nothing heavier than the self, than the atta. As soon as we attach to something, as soon as the mind grasps at something, there is self. And this self is heavy. And then even more nasty than that is that when there is self, there follows selfishness. And selfishness is even heavier because the heaviness falls upon others also. Due to selfishness, we harm, take advantage of, and abuse others. And so the weight gets even worse, gets even heavier. This is the heaviest thing, this self and its selfishness. First there is attachment out of this self is born, and then selfishness follows. These are the heaviest things in the world. Please look carefully until you see for yourself that all the problems in this world, or excuse me, that this world is being run by selfishness. Take a good look and you'll see that the world is being run by selfishness. And so we could say the entire universe is being dominated by selfishness. And then selfishness tries to force the world to go according to its desires. So then all the problems, all the crises of this modern world, the economic problems, the political crises such as in the Middle East, the environmental problems, crime, drug abuse, exploitation of women and children, and on and on, all of these problems are due to selfishness. These, this selfishness keeps forcing the world to run in this way. And this is what makes life so difficult, so dangerous, so painful for so many people. If we look back 10,000 or even 100,000 years to the primitive humans who were living in the forests and caves, running around naked, we'll see that they, they didn't have many problems because there was very little selfishness. 
material development, technology and all that had not yet existed and so people didn't have any problems. But then through technological and material advancement or progress, human beings developed more and more things to be selfish about. Until now in the modern world, with all our great scientific, technological and material advancement, all our luxuries, we're full up with selfishness. Everything, we spend so much time and effort on material things that we're full of selfishness. Now what's really ridiculous about this is though we think, or although we're acting out of self-interest and self-centeredness, the first thing we end up doing is harming ourselves and then we harm others. This is quite absurd that although we're acting selfishly, the selfishness in fact hurts ourselves first of all, but then we go and harm and abuse others, other people, animals, the environment also. So one can look and see that selfishness is running the world, running our universe. And nowadays we've got all kinds of education. We're all very highly educated. The problem though is our education doesn't do anything to limit or lessen selfishness. In fact, our education strengthens selfishness. It expands selfishness, makes it more subtle and more refined. So our modern education, rather than limiting and lessening selfishness, actually increases it and makes it a more intractable problem than ever. And so our lives are dominated by this selfishness. Our, our high education do nothing to, to solve this basic problem. So now we've got all kinds of wonderful technological material development. We've got radios, televisions, cars, airplanes, computers, lasers, and all kinds of fancy stuff. But at the same time, we don't have peace. There's even less peace in the world in spite of all our material technological wizardry. The primitive, our primitive ancestors, they didn't even have clothes. And so they, and they didn't have the problems that we've got. They didn't have all these problems of selfishness. The more selfish we are, the less peace there is. The more selfish we are following our education, the more we're educated in selfishness, the less there is peace. So one should look very carefully at this reality the fact that there is not much peace in this world. Even within our own society, there's large segments of society that are impoverished, abused, exploited, so that many of us even run away from home. We can't stand our own country because there's no peace. But wherever we go, this selfishness, is destroying peace. We just can't escape it. One should look at this very carefully and start to ask, how can we find peace? Where are we going to bring peace to this world?
just more material development, more technology, more education of the kind we've got now isn't going to do any, us any more any good. So consider where, where are we going to find peace? And you'll see that there is no peace as long as there is selfishness, egoism, self-centeredness. What kind of ridiculous and also quite pitiful is that we speak of evolution. We're very proud of our evolution and that human beings are supposedly the pinnacle of evolution. But it's just an evolution of selfishness. There's no way you can speak of it as being an evolution of peace. This evolution we're so proud of is selfish evolution, not peaceful evolution. One ought to take a good look at this. And because of all this selfishness, we have all kinds of problems that we shouldn't have, that there's it's absolutely stupid to have some of the problems we've got. If we look at our ancestors who ran around naked, they didn't have a lot of the problems that we've got. The problem of drug addiction didn't exist then. They didn't have a problem with pollution. They didn't have to worry about AIDS and many of the other diseases of civilization and development. There's something back, we've got something extra now that they didn't have. And so we've also got all kinds of problems that there's no excuse for, there's no real reason why we should have such problems. But because of our our development, our selfish evolution, we've got all these problems so that we're very frightened people. We don't know how to relax. We can't actually enjoy life because of all these fears and problems and worries we've created through our own selfishness. Why not stop and think for a minute of how those people must be laughing at us? If they could see us now, how they would be laughing at the ridiculous condition we're in. When they see us with all our stress, all our neuroses, all our selfishness and all our problems, they'd be rolling up, falling over themselves, laughing. Our, long ago, they didn't have all these, these problems, problems like pollution and drug addiction. They didn't, they didn't have these problems. Look at, look at the world nowadays. We're killing each other more than ever. People are cons committing suicide in greater and greater numbers. Abortion is growing. There's more and more murder, more and more suicide, more and more abortion. We keep having to build prisons and mental hospitals. The armies and police forces keep expanding. The primitive people, our ancestors, they didn't, they didn't have any of these things. They didn't need, they didn't need insane asylums, police forces, and all these other things. Why not look at our world in this way? How by developing solely 
through selfishness. By being way overdeveloped in selfish ways, we've created a world like this. Why doesn't anybody stop and look at things in this way? How our ancestors must be laughing at us. And then realize that we've made an error, that our the path we followed has included many errors so that we can begin to correct things. So the people living in the forests and caves, they didn't have all of these problems. They weren't civilized and developed like this. If we could say that we have no problems, if we could say, could say that we have solved all our problems, then we could say that we are better off than our ancestors. But we can't say that. We're, this world is full up with problems. Although we claim to have solved many problems, we keep creating new ones. So this is, and all of these problems come from selfishness. We need to see that all of these problems troubling us which make the modern world so ridiculous and pitiful. We need to see that all of them come from selfishness. And selfishness comes from having a self, from, th from thinking in terms of self. And so this is why Buddhism teaches not self or anatta to to deal with this fundamental problem of self and the selfishness that comes from having a self and then all the crises that are created by selfishness. So we study the fact of not-self in order to remove all these problems of self, selfishness and this world of problems and suffering. The Thais have a saying, pi huarok. Pi are like spirits in the trees, in the earth, everywhere, in the sky. You can think of them as spirits or angels or heavenly beings or whatever. But this is the Thais speak of these quite a bit. And the spirits are laughing. Pi huara means the spirits are laughing. They're laughing at, at your stupidity. They're at laughing at the stupidity of modern man and woman. It's like the, our primitive ancestors laughing at us, but those those ancestors are gone, but the, the spirits are still here, everywhere, all around us, in the sky, in the ground, in the water, all over the place. And they're laughing at the stupidity of, of humanity, of all the, all the ridiculous things we do, of all the, at all the problems we cause ourselves. The P, the spirits are really having a good laugh at us these days. If we were a little bit ashamed, embarrassed by the spirits laughing at us, then we wouldn't do so many foolish and harmful things. We wouldn't act so wrongly. And there would be more peace in the world if only we were a little bit ashamed of ourselves at being laughed at by the Spirit. Now we'll discuss the, the arising and existence of self and selfishness.
we'd like to talk about what is called Pawa, Pawa or Bhava. Bhava, which means the existence of self, the existing of self. Someone requested that we talk about this. So we'll talk about the, the meaning of bhava, the existence of self, which is something very difficult to understand. This word bhava, B-H-A-V-A, is a little bit difficult to translate into English. It's usually translated as existence or being, occasionally as becoming. You should see though that the meaning of this word is broader than any single translation. When we speak of existence, first there is a becoming. It begins, bhava first is a becoming. Then there is existing. And finally a state of being. Bhava can be translated with all three of these and includes them all. First a becoming, then an existing, and then a state of being. This is, or these three, and this state of being is then the basis for the the birth of self, the arising of self. Out of this bhava, this becoming, existing, and state of being, there is I, the me. Now we don't just mean physical existence. We actually don't mean physical existence at all, but we're referring to a mental existence or even spiritual kind of existence. This becoming existing and state of being refers to something mental. It's, if we use the word spiritual abode, this should help you to understand what is meant. The mind creates a place to be. The mind creates a place to exist. And this then is where the self can exist. However, this is a deceptive thought. There, this, this thing isn't actually real. It's an illusion concocted by the mind, although it in itself isn't real. Nonetheless, this, this deceptive thought leads to all kinds of selfishness and many problems. So it's a, this becoming, existing, and state of being is something the mind creates as a spiritual abode, a place for the self to exist. Since the Buddha's time and probably even before, we have talked about three kinds of bhava, three kinds of these states of being. The first is Kama, which means the being in sex sexuality, existing with sexuality. Then there is Rupa, which is existing with form, but pure form, not, not a form that is mixed up with sexuality and sensuality, but just form of itself. And then arupa, which is the formless, existing within formlessness. These are 
three kinds of being, or we could say three states of being, which are of course mental. In order to save time and still be able to understand this, we'll use a simple example. We'll take a housewife. Let's say for this hour, our housewife is involved with her husband in the bedroom. So for an hour, totally involved and busy with sex. That's Kama Bhava, existing in sexuality. And then the next hour, our housewife is just involved with taking care of a ba her baby or dealing with household things like money, wealth, possessions, furniture, things like this. In this hour, this is, this is Rupa Bhava, existence with or in form. And then the next hour, her whole attention and interest, her involvement is with, say, doing good, with charity, with earning merit to, to, and developing virtues in order to go to heaven or something. And then this is Arupa Bhava, existence with the formless. So these are some easy examples of three kinds of Bhava, that of Dhamma Bhava, existing in sexuality, Rupa Bhava, existing in form, and Arupa Bhava, existing in the formless. There are these three kinds of bhava or states of being. To understand bhava, we need to completely, we must understand all three types of the bhava. All three of these bhavas occur with this one single body. All three kinds of beings or existences <clears throat> occur in just this life. But if we follow the orthodox traditional approach, the very conservative approach, whether of Theravada or Mahayana Buddhism, then they, they put these existences off somewhere else. They speak of the sexual realm as a whole other world that one, after dying, one goes to the sexual existences. They speak of the, the form existences as whole other world there are even list, you know, there's even a hierarchy of these, these worlds of where the Brahma gods live in form, the existences of pure form. And then the formless is even more worlds where the, a higher kind of Brahma, of Brahma god exists with formlessness or totally formless existence. So the, this traditional approach, which is very conservative and not exactly Buddhist, it's actually more Hindu or something, but nonetheless many so-called Buddhists um, talk about such things. They're often totally different worlds that have nothing to do with our present life. And so what good are any of those existences? How are they going to solve any, any problems in this life if they're just... So if we, 
if we hold to these kind of explanations, then that's a whole other meaning, this very orthodox approach. But if we're, we take the, the Buddhist meaning, then these existences need to be here, in this life. Because Buddhism is concerned with this life, what's happening now. And so these three existences, as taught in, as properly taught in Buddhism, aren't all somewhere else, but are just found within this life. In fact, they can all be found today, right, right here and now. We experience sexual existence, form existence, and formless existence. These three states of being are experienced today by all of us. So we need to, to find them and understand them in this way, if it's to be the Buddhist approach, if it's to be relevant to life, if it's to have any practical value. What's even more ridiculous is that these people who talk of the bhavas out there somewhere in these different worlds up in the sky someplace, they say that in the sexual existences, they, these last for a hundred years. When you're born in these existences, you live there for a hundred years that the form existences last for tens of thousands of years. And then the formless Brahma gods in the formless existences, these last for hundreds of thousands of years. Of what, of what value or use is any of that? If these things only change every 10,000 or 100,000 years. Of what relevance does that have to our own lives? There's, those are things that can't be changed, can't, we can't do anything with them, it's totally out of our control. Why, why bother with, with any of it? But if we understand the existences to be here in this life, you see that they're changing all the time. Sexual existence might only last five or ten minutes. For example, our housewife, maybe she spends ten, fifteen minutes with her husband, and then ten minutes with a child or possession, and then five minutes doing good or with charity, with being virtuous. In this life, these existences are, are changing every five, ten minutes. In one hour, there can be many existences. And so this is something that's changing all the time in ordinary life. And so it's something that needs to be controlled. We need to be on top of all this existence. So it's much more relevant and useful, these existences that we see today in our own lives and not in some lives who knows where. Now we'd like to, we'd like to look at the problems arising from these three bhavas, these three existences. <clears throat> For example, we can take our housewife again. When she's involved in sex with her husband, there are all kinds of problems and difficulties trying to please her partner, trying to get some fun out of it herself, and so on and so forth. It can be all, 
one set of problems and hassles in the sexual existence. And then when dealing with the children, with the house, the furniture, the bank book, money and things like this, there are another set of problems and difficulties involved with form existence. And then when, when dealing with honor, with fame, with doing good, with virtue, there are other difficulties in maintaining and developing things like one's, like a good name or respect. So whatever kind of existence it is, whether sexual, form, or formless, there they come, it comes with various difficulties and problems. As soon as there is bhava, this existence, state of being, then there is chati, the birth of self, the birth of I, me, and then there will be problems. As soon as, as long as there is I, as long as I exist, I will have problems. And so through whatever kind of existence it is, this is the place where self is born, and then the self has problems. <clears throat> so our question is then, how can we be free of these, the problems of bhava? How can our housewife live without the problems of sexu sexual form and formless existence? It's impossible that she will have nothing to do with any of these. For the ordinary housewife, sex is part of life. Dealing with the house and children and possessions is part of life. Dealing with one's reputation and name and trying to be a good person. All of these are necessary parts of life. So how can our housewife be free of the problems of these three kinds of existence? Now these things aren't just problems for the housewife. They're also problems for the house husband. He also has to deal with all these different kinds of existence. And so the husband and the wife need to be very good friends to cooperate and help each other to deal properly with the different kinds of being, the different kinds of becoming and existence, so that they're not problems, so that it's not just a bunch of suffering. So let's look at this, at bhava a little more closely in order to see how to deal with them so that it's not just more problems. So we'd like to take a minute to speak about marriage. Marriage should be where a man and a woman live together in such a way that they don't increase their problems. As individuals, a woman and a man already have have already had problems with the different kinds of existence. When we get married, we shouldn't just increase our problems, especially to make all kinds, many more problems out of sex, as is commonly done. Most people, when they get married, then turn sex into a lot of craziness. Except nowadays, especially in the West, people don't even wait for marriage. To, they just become lovers and then make lots of problems out of sexual existence, let alone the, the other kind. But marriage or real love ought to mean that there is understanding between both, both partners, that both of them understand these existences well enough so that they don't make more problems out of sexuality, form, and 
formlessness. This means we, so if we really have a, if we have a real marriage or a Dhamma marriage, it's necessary to solve the problems of these different kinds of existence, which means we need to study them carefully to understand them. We'd like to use the terms sexual existence and then formish existence. This word doesn't exist in any English dictionary, so we'd like to make one up. Formish existence and then finally formless existence. One needs to understand all three kinds of, of being. However, the later two, nobody's at, at all interested in. <clears throat> and even the, the very basic one of sexuality, very few people can actually manage it or get it, get it straight. So it's time to start to understand these three kinds of bhava, of existence, so that they are no longer problems for us. So, please don't make marriage just more problems. Marriage shouldn't just be an increase of problems. Marriage ought to be a way to decrease and eliminate problems. In a world of fools, marriage just brings more problems. But in a world of intelligent people, Marriage is a way of solving problems, of combining the strengths, experience, and intelligence of two people in order to solve the problems of life rather than to increase them. To do so, one must thoroughly understand the three bhavas. So we ask that you study them very carefully. We must pass the lessons of these three existences. All three of them will be lessons for us that we must pass. They will test us and we must pass these tests in order to graduate to Nibbana. Nibbana is that which is beyond, above these three existences. But to graduate into Nibbana, we must pass and pass the test of all these forms of existence. Even for the Christians to, to, to be with God, to enter the kingdom of God, to do so we must learn the lessons of these three kinds of existence we must pass their test in order to graduate into the kingdom of God. And so let's understand these different existences so we can mm. pass the test and graduate to a life that is without problem. The first lesson is that of Kama Bhava. The words don't confuse it with Kama or Karma, but Kama, K long A M A, or sexual existence. This is a lesson that we cannot avoid because nature has arranged things so that we inevitably experience sexuality. There's just no way that we can avoid it. So we meet, need to learn and pass this lesson. In order to, to reproduce, nature has arranged for sexuality. Reproduction in itself is not much fun. The work, the effort, the stress involved in the reproductive process 
is quite a bit of difficulty. And we wouldn't do it if it wasn't for the fact that nature arranged for sex or sexuality. In the reproductive process, nature has added the sexual feelings. And this is the only reason why anybody would bother with reproduction in the first place. So here you can, reproduction and sex are two different things. There's just the physical reproduction. And then sex is more the mental feeling. And then there's this sexual existence from that. You can see sex and the the strong kinds of physical pleasure that come from sex as being wages. Nature hires us to reproduce and the payoff is, is sex. How many of you would bother with all the hassle if there wasn't this payoff? And in fact, it's so effective that people spend hours, days, years very willingly getting involved in all these very difficult business because the payoff is so strong and because people like it so much. This is true just not just for the housewife, but for the house husband as well. So there's this basic lesson in life. It's it's there from the start. For example, many modern psychologists, most of all Freud, emphasize the importance of sexuality. And there's quite a bit of truth in that. That the infant, even before knowing sex itself, has a kind of sexuality. For example, in acts like urinating and defecating, the child experiences some sexual pleasure. There's a kind of satisfaction and pleasantness in passing urine or when the lump of feces drops out. The child feels good. There's a a very basic level of sexual feeling in even these acts. This is how nature has arranged things. And so all of us must pass through these sexual existences. It's happening to us, so we need to learn the lesson, to pass the test so that we no longer have any problems due to sexuality. But most people are just infatuated with sex. They they haven't taken a good look at it. They're so bewitched by the powerful pleasures that sex pays that nobody looks at it very completely. Nobody notices that sex is just a way to trick us into spending all the time and effort to reproduce. Nature requires that the species reproduces. And so it tricks us into doing what's necessary. But very few people take the the time or make the effort to step back and take a look at it. Instead, people simply indulge in sexual existence. They chase after it. We make all kinds of TV shows and movies, perfumes. Look at the way people dress, the way people walk and talk chasing after sexual existence. We need to start to learn this lesson so that we can graduate from it, where we no longer make any problems, when we're no longer trapped and controlled by sexual existence. Once we get married, our excitement and Um, infatuation with sexual existence begins to weaken a bit. And there begins to be much more concern with material existence or formish existence, dealing with 
the house, the car, the furniture, the possession, the bills, the bank book, and all these things, getting a VCR, a computer, mountain bikes, and all that. So there, we, the, there's a natural tendency that one, the interest in sexual existence diminishes and the the concern, the involvement with formish existence develops. And then later, as one grows older, those things begin to fade as well. The house is paid for, no, but no one, nobody cares whether the car is so fast anymore and all those things begin to fade and there's people as they get old begin to realize that death is coming and so they they want to do good and store up merit and so they start going to church or going to the temple and doing things so in the formless existences so in an ordinary life for ordinary people, all three kinds of existences are present. Each of us go through all of these different existences. So we need to learn their, their lessons. If we merely pass through or merely go spinning around in these different kinds of existences, we, we don't learn so much. When sexuality weakens and we get more involved in, in formish existence, that doesn't mean we're necessarily any better or wiser, unless we've actually learned what these different existences have to teach us. We need to study them in order to get free of them for the sake of emancipation. Normally, we're trapped in one of these different forms of existence. If not sexuality, then the formish. If not that, then the formless existence. From moment to moment, generally, we're trapped in one of these. We need to learn what it's all about in order to be emancipated from all types and kinds of existence. There's a word awajara, which means ready to fall into. It's a habit of falling into. And so we use this in terms of the three bhavas. When there's the people who are always ready to fall into sexual existence, we then speak of as existing in sexuality. Those who are have the habit of falling into formish existence we speak of as being or in this of existing in form and then those who are have the habit of falling into formless existence we speak of as that it's a way of speaking about the general habit or tendency of people in fact we're we're falling into all of these but different people will have a predilection or their habit tends towards sexuality or towards formishness or formlessness. So they are these, these habits of falling into the different states of being. We will study these in meditation, in Dhamma practice, we study these different states of existence so that we don't need to fall into them. We speak of people according to their, their habit of which one they fall into the most. But in fact, we're not existing. In reality, we're simply just existing in this body, in this world. Naturally, that's all that's happening. But mentally, there are these three, we keep falling into these three kinds of existence. We study them 
in order to understand and from this understanding we can control these different kinds of existence. We need not be the slave to these different kinds of existence. Instead we can be in control, in charge. Now all of the kinds of existence are difficult and the most difficult of all is the sexual existence. It's the hardest to control. It's the hardest to get free of. Right now, therefore, we ought to, we ought to take a good look at ourselves and see which kind of existence are we tending towards? Which way do we incline? Towards sexuality, towards the form, or towards formlessness? Almost certainly, for, um, for most of us, it's the sexual existence. It's very difficult for people to get free of that and exist primarily in formish existence or formless existence. Most people are primarily going at falling into the sexual and sensual existences. One should take a good look at it oneself to see what's what's going on. And then with time we may raise ourselves up out of beyond sexuality and then beyond the formish existences and eventually even get free of formless existence. The way to do so is to develop the understanding of what's actually happening through studying dependent origination and then practicing anapanasati or mindfulness with breathing in order to be able to put the understanding of de dependent origination into practice. We'll speak about dependent origination and mindfulness with breathing later, but these are the, are necessary if we are to control the existences. Thank you for being very good and patient listeners. You patiently and we, we thank you. May you all be successful according to the aspiration to understand and practice Dhamma which has brought you here. Thank you.